Thanks so much, Mike. Much appreciated, mate. Guys, in the beginning of the year, we said to each other that uh, we feel like our people are a little bit flat. We feel like our people need some encouragement. We feel like our people need to be led to a place of all about God is awesomeness and the gospel once again. So we decided to do a series about God, about God's character, and a series about who He revealed Himself to be through the course of the Bible. Because we believe if we herald this, if we preach this, if we give you this good news, it will change things for you both outside and in. During this series, we are studying the revelation of God from page one of the Bible all the way through to the end, and then we are talking and teaching about what it is that we see. And not only do we talk about it and teach about it, we also talk about what this means to us here and now on the 6th of March in 2022. So we started out by a really, really deep study of God's name, titled Yahweh is our God. We have a God who did all these magnificent things and He has a name and His name means that He is with us and His name means that He is the same yesterday, today and forever and that He will continue to be. That's good news because you can count on Him as the consistent one. We also spoke about a characteristic of God that is really important for us as Christians and that is that God is a judge but He's a gracious judge. And what does it mean to know Him as a gracious judge? Then we trace the whole story of the Old Testament all the way through to the birth of Jesus. And we talk, uh, um, we talk about Jesus' family story to show that this Jesus being born in the same way that it was announced today, at least, is not a random story or a random character in the story. He was supposed to come from the beginning because he was the promised one to do the promised thing, which is salvation. And then last week, the circle talk on Mark chapter 2, specifically about God in Jesus being the one who can forgive sins. And that's really, really good news. And not only does He forgive sin, He also restores you, heals you, leads you to a place of wholeness. Now today we are going to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has four names in the Bible. The Spirit, God's Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Does that mean that it's inconsistent and they don't know who they're talking about? Absolutely not. It's just four names. My name's Reino. Most people call me Reino. But some people call me Blitz because it's my second name. Other people call me Mayer because it's my surname. Other people call me Mayer or my A if you want to because that's a way that you can chop up my surname and then make fun of it. It's still the same guy. It's just four different names. And in the same way the Holy Spirit gets referred to with these four names. Now, let's just stop for a minute. And think, do a little word association. If I say to you, the Holy Spirit, what's the first thing you think about? Say again. We've got comforter. Give me two more. He's up. Living inside of me. Anyone else? Just shout it out, guys. Healer. Okay. Comforter, living inside of you, healer, etc., etc. Most people find it kind of difficult to explain the Holy Spirit, exactly who He is and what He does. And the reason why we find it difficult to explain, I believe, is because we differ in our views of the Holy Spirit and what it's supposed to do, right? So we have a spectrum, as we always have in Christianity. The one side says that the Spirit is not to be made much of, and the other side says the Spirit is everything. And then in between, every single church of the 485,000 different types of churches we have in this world fits on this spectrum. And can I just say, I don't know how we made it that you split up one person, Jesus, in 485,000 different types of churches. It's impossible. The world currently has 53,000 official denominations. How is it possible, guys, that we can differ about Jesus in 33,000 different ways? Just saying. Anyhow, so on this spectrum, you find either the Spirit is everything and we should make everything of Him the whole time. And on this side, we have the Spirit is not to be made much of because there was a time in the where the Spirit moved. And then in between, there's all these different views. How would you explain it? In fact, if you had a coffee conversation in the square now, someone said, hey, talk to me about the Holy Spirit. Explain to me the work of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, and why it exists and what we should do with it. What would you say? Now, over the course of the next six weeks, we are going to try and help each other 
by building a picture of the, the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. So it's going to take us six weeks. I'm not going to teach you everything today that there is to be known about the Holy Spirit. Only one part. And it's going to take us six weeks to build a new frame of understanding and a new picture of the person of the work of the Holy Spirit. Why? Why do we need to do this? Check this statement. Bold statement, I know. It's because it will change your life. If you know the Spirit and you experience it, and you discover the richness of God dwelling inside of you and transforming you into the image of Christ, I am telling you now, it is going to change your life. So you should listen, whether you want to or not, whether it interests you or not, whether it stirred up something inside of you, I will give you the promise that it will change your life. Quick story, the day after I got saved, a pastor named Albi explained the good news of Jesus Christ to me. So I gave my life to God, and I woke up the next morning and I realized I've got so much sin, there's no way that I'm ever going to pay for it, or be able to pay for it. God is going to smite me, strike me down, and kill me. And I called this pastor, and I'm like, dude, you have to get me across the line before I die. And then when I sat down with him, he explained grace to me. After I confessed of all my sins for two and a half hours long, I cried so much, I felt like a dried out razor. He said to me, your sins are forgiven. That was great news. And I left, and as I got into the car, he said to me, Raymond, Raymond, look at me, look at me. The Holy Spirit is now going to start working inside of you. It's going to feel weird. You might not always know if it's in. But here's what I want you to do. Obey right away. Like that was my first lesson in discipleship. Obey right away. If you think it's God telling you to do something, just do it. And in that way, you will learn the work of the Holy Spirit. And that was 17 years ago. And guys, let me tell you, my life has changed. Because I know the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And I hope that it will change your life too. Here's where we're going to land today. The Spirit is a life giver. The Spirit is a life giver. That's the theme of our sermon. That's where we're going to land. And those are the three things that I want you to hold in your head. Spirit, life. I pray for us, let me ask you a question. How's life for you at the moment? Energy. Challenging. Anyone else want to volunteer an answer? Good. Do you feel alive? Do you feel like you're living life to the full? Do you feel tired? Low battery? Despondent? Not necessarily know what's happening. The sermon is for you. Because of the good news for you, and that is that the Spirit gives life. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, as we open up the Word now, we pray that you move among us. We pray that uh, we will get to know you more. We pray that we will stand in awe of you. We pray that we will experience this rich truth of you being among us in this place. I pray that you bless the words that we'll speak now and the teaching that will come. I pray that in your name. If you don't know the Bible, or if you do know the Bible, the teaching text is a very popular text. You would know it, and you probably thought to yourself, why on earth do we have a Christmas sermon on the 6th of March? If you don't know the Bible, and this is one of the first times that you read the story, you'll probably think that it was an epic story, because it is. I underlined a few words in the teaching text. It wasn't like that in the original Bible, and also not in the one that Mike read. But I underlined a few things to you, just because I want to show you that this story comes from somewhere. Imagine that you're watching a movie. It's 90 minutes long, and we just floated in here on 60 minutes. So there's 60 minutes of story that already took place. And I showed you a very specific scene now. And I underlined a few words in the teaching text, just to help us understand where this scene comes from. So Ruth, if we can just see the two slides of the teaching text again. The first one was the word God. Still the same God we're talking about, the God that we've been talking about through the course of the whole testament. Elohim, the creator of everything. And then the Lord, God's name, Yahweh. Still the same God we're talking about, still on the same mission with his people. Can you guys remember what that mission was? If you can just show me the second slide. Please, Rudolf. Favor, guys. Blessing. God created everything in the beginning and he blessed it. 
And he's always wanted to bless people. They've always turned their backs on God's blessing because they think they're cool and sinful and wiser than God himself. And then they end up in a really bad space and then they need to be blessed again. Never does God curse a human being in the Bible. Never. He only curses the evil one in Genesis chapter 3. So this announcement says blessing is back because favor with God has been found. And then a new character gets introduced. And his name is Jesus, Yeshua, the Savior, the one who will save. The one whose very name means Yahweh saves. Okay, so does this Jesus has anything? Does he have anything to do with Yahweh? Of course, Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. And who's the big instigator in this whole portion of Scripture? There we go, the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit will move. There's a verb, an active verb there, come upon you. It'll happen with power. I underline that one for you. And he'll do it in a way that overshadows you. Interesting word. He's going to hover. He's going to cover. We'll check where this comes from now. So take a note of all these words. And then let's get in a time machine. And we travel back all the way to the beginning of the story. And then I'm going to take you through a couple of scenes in the story, which will help us to understand why this is one of the best things, well, the best thing that ever happened to this earth. So what happens in this story is the Spirit creates life, and He gives life. He hovers in a dark and unready place. Mary has never been with a man, so there's no potential for life in the womb at the moment. And through the Holy Spirit, life comes forth, and He brings forth something. So let's trace the pattern. Open up your Bible in Genesis chapter 1. I don't have that on the slides, so the first two scripture readings you're going to have to browse there or scroll there yourself, and then from Psalm 33 we'll put it back on the slides. Let's read the first two verses. The first three verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the same God we just read about now. Now the earth was formless and empty. Tohu vavoru is the Hebrew word. It means wild, waste, nothing going on there. Think post-apocalyptic wasteland in your favorite zombie movie. I don't know if you watch zombie movies, I don't. But if you do, think of those scenes. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. And the, here we go, Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, okay, so spirit hovering, and then there's a word being spoken. Let there be light, and there was light. I mean, this is a sermon in itself. But what we see happening here is something that is wild and waste gets transformed into something that has order and is beautiful. And it gets transformed, it gets transformed to that by a spirit hovering over it, covering it, and then a word being spoken. Isn't it beautiful? I mean, anything being changed from wild and waste to orderly and beautiful resonates with me. I don't know how that resonates with you. The word that's being used here for spirit is the Hebrew word ruach. Ruach. And Ruach gets used in the Old Testament to describe two things. On the one hand, it's used to describe the word spirit, the thing inside of you that is your being that you cannot see. And it also gets used to describe the word breath. Okay, so Ruach is used both for spirit and for breath. So is it either or, or is it both and? Well, it's both spirit and and breath. Some of you have your masks on. If you have your mask on, you don't have to cover your mouth. But if you don't have your mask on at the moment, just cover your mouth and say, Eta, Eta, Eta. Do you guys feel the movement? Okay, if you can't say Eta as cool as I can, I'm joking. You need to say, Hello, hello, hello. Something just left my body. What's that? It's my breath. It's my ruach. That I felt against my hand. But if I don't have Ruach, I'm dead. If I would collapse on the stage now, 
Someone will get up and probably say, like in the movies, call an ambulance. And then someone will come and do what? Immediately check if I'm breathing. Because if I'm breathing, I'm alive. And if I'm not breathing, I'm dead. So your ruach, your innermost being, is connected to this very thing that signals the life. And that's the fact that you actually have breath. In Greek, in the New Testament, ruach gets translated with pneuma or pneuma. Right? That's where we get pneumonia from. So lungs. So it gets translated with the word pneuma. Now turn the page to Genesis chapter 2 and read in verse 7 what God did. Then the Lord God formed the man, Adam, this is uh, the East Hebrew name, out of the dust from the ground. The Hebrew word for ground is Adama. So Adam comes from Adama. And breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and the man became a living being. So who gives life? God. How does he give life? By transferring his breath into us. He sang that earlier. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. If I did not have God breathing Ruach into my nose, I would not be here. And if I did not have God starting that cycle of life, I still won't be here. And the day I die is the day that my ruach gets taken back. When I don't have any more breath to breathe. Here's what I want you to see from the first two pages of the Bible. This is how the Spirit rolls. That's what He does. He hovers, He covers, and with power He creates. And with power He gives life. And if we only read these two pages of the Bible and someone asks you, where does life come from? The answer is, it comes from the Spirit, from breath being transferred. Now, we played a little bit with the words breathtaking earlier, because if you just put the picture of the ocean up for me, I told you that this takes my breath away. But taking my breath away is actually a other oxymoron or a paradox, depending on how you see it, because your breath can't be taken away. But in those moments that you feel like your breath is taken away, how do you notice that your breath was taken away? Is because you start breathing again. You guys feel me? So if I sit with my toes in the sand here, and I see the sun becoming clearer and clearer and brighter and brighter, and I hear wave after wave after wave crashing and birds singing, there's something that resonates so deeply with me because I know that someone did that, and someone did this, and that someone is the same thing. That someone is the Creator God, but He did it through His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gets introduced in the Bible before the Son, since the beginning. Now John chapter 1 says the Son was also there in the beginning, so that's really important for us to know, because God is three persons in one. We'll chat about that on a different Sunday. But you become aware of breath and life in you, and you become aware of the fact that if there's no breath, there was no life, and then you become aware of the fact that none of this would have ever been possible, these breathtaking moments, if God did not breathe life into it. So the first thing that you need to know is you and everything else has its life through God's Spirit. Period. So that's where it starts. And it's the same Spirit that conceived new life in Mary's womb that was unready. It's the same God who lives inside of us and gives us life. Think of the Bible in six movements. I just want to build a quick frame for us and then we're going to read a little lot of scripture as we progress through this. The Bible in six movements. Creation, we just read it. Fall or sin, well, that comes on the next page of the Bible. And then after that, there's a really long portion of the Bible that we call Israel, because it's the history of God and His people. Then there's the most important part of the Bible, which is Jesus, four books. And then there's the fifth movement in the Bible called the Church and the Spirit. And then there's the end, restoration, redemption, if you want to. Do you guys realize that we are still on that linear line in the history of the Bible? Why? Where are we now? We are in G uh, the church and the spirit. So Jesus came. We read about it. We've got accounts of it. We know that he was raised from the dead, that he was exalted, that he ascended, and we know that he poured out his spirit, and we know that he's currently reigning as the exalted king, and we know him personally. But we know that everything has not been redeemed or restored like it should be. So we are in the fifth movement of the Bible. 
And what I want to show you now is that the Spirit is everywhere in the Bible, giving life and creating new things, except in the second act. So in the first act, the Spirit works. In the second act, the work of the Spirit is being undermined by the sin of the people, and it breaks what the Spirit made. But then the Spirit didn't give up. The Spirit was there all through Israel. The Spirit was there all through the life of Jesus. We'll get to that in a couple of weeks' time when Jesus gets, gets baptized. And the Spirit is still working in the church of Jesus Christ, which is in us now. So God's Word is also still there. That's why we read uh, verse 3. Did you guys see that when you speak, your ruach exits you? And God created by speaking. And as he spoke, his ruach exited him, and he created life. Let's take a couple of samples from the Old Testament. Psalm 33, verses 4 to 6. I'm just going to read it. I'm just going to show you the bold words, and we'll move through them quickly each. For the word of the Lord is right. And all his work is trustworthy. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is kind of full, no, full of the Lord's unfailing love, like it was in the beginning. The heavens were made by the word of the Lord, and all the stars by the breath of his mouth. Ruach and his spoken word. Exactly like it is with us. Something happens inside of us when our breath exits us and we speak. God did exactly that. That's how everything came into existence. And as He had His breath leave Him, His Spirit leave Him, it created everything we see. This was years after Genesis 1. But this was written by a person in a specific place, in a specific time, thinking about what they're experiencing and seeing, and then writing this down as a confession. It's word, it's full. It's his breath. Let's take a big sample from the book of Job. Two uh, uh, parts we look at there. This is Elihu, Elihu speaking from Job's mates. Now Job's in a really bad space and his friends are trying to convince him about what's going on. Or at least give him their two cents. Or ten cents. How much ever they want to give. And this is what Elihu says when he starts speaking. He says, The Spirit of God has made me. Ruach. And the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Ruach, same thing. So I just want to show you guys that it's not a great story in the beginning of the Bible that doesn't have its, have its roots all through the Bible. It's a confession of the people in the history of the Bible. Let's look at Job chapter 34, verses 15, 14 to 15. If he puts his mind to it, if he speaks now about what God can do, and probably should do, and withdrew the spirit and breath he gave. Every living thing would perish together, and mankind would return to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Thus. So mankind comes from dust, but something happened to the dust that made him awesome. But if God decides to take what made him awesome out of him, he's just going to go back to dust. This is a firm belief held by the people of the Old Testament that you cannot live without him. And that the Spirit is the one that gives life. Look at Psalm 104, verses 24 to 30. The psalmist writes, How countless are your works, Lord, Yahweh. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. We read this in Genesis chapter 1. Here's the sea, vast and wide, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. Great God. Verse 27, all of them wait for you to give them their food at the right time. When you give it to them, they gather it. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. So if the breath of God or the provision of God or the life that gets created by the Spirit is gone, you're dead. That's what it says. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your breath, they are created and you renew the surface of the ground. We just read about this in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. The psalmist believes it. Who was the God who said to people, look at the birds of the air and look at the flowers of the field and look how God cares for them and sustains them. 
Wouldn't he care for you and sustain you, seeing that you're so much more worth than that? Who was that guy? It was Jesus. Jesus knew this song. Jesus had this firm belief that nothing could have come into being without God and without His Spirit. And He also knew that God will sustain it through His Spirit. Let's look at Acts. So now we're making a huge jump from the third act, which is Israel. We're jumping over Jesus because we'll get back to it now. And we are now in the fifth act, the church and the spirit. This is the Apostle Paul chatting to people, wanting to tell them about Jesus, looking for an entrance into the faith conversation. And then he goes, well, there's something that all of us have in common. And that is that all of this that we see had to come from somewhere. So I'm going to start my conversation about Jesus with these people who don't know him at this place. Look at what he says. The God who made the world and everything in it, God, to him, made the world and everything in it, Genesis 1, he is Lord, Yahweh, of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. For, sorry, since he himself, here we go, gives everyone life and breath and all things. Do you guys want to know where this started? Paul says, from one man. So he's covering the whole story by those three words, from one man. He has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. And obviously Paul's playing on words now because the one man is also Jesus who rectified everything that the original man broke. So Paul uses this exact same understanding. He's a student of the Old Testament. He understands that the Spirit gives life. And that's where he starts his conversation with people to eventually take them back to Jesus. Now let's take one last look at the teaching text. Here's what I want you to see. It's the same God doing the same things. But he's doing something brand new here. He's creating life once again. And he's creating it in power once again. But through this act of life, we will be saved. This was the decisive act or place where the Spirit gave life. And in him giving life to Jesus, Jesus could have lived the life that he lived. He died the death that he died. He was resurrected from the dead as the first one to be able to do it. And he ascended to heaven, promoted, right, in status. And he'll come back. That, uh, uh, that whole story, that whole good news, that whole gospel was caused or came into being or was possible because of this one act of the Spirit giving life. And through this act, the Savior came, and after the Savior came, we can have life. Here's the clincher. What did Jesus say about himself? It's another prayer of prayer. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. This very thing that I gave to the whole earth in the beginning, this very thing that I always wanted you to have, this very thing that I've always called you back to, is the very thing that I will now give back to you through me. You've always wanted life. We spoke about breathtaking moments. We spoke about how life currently is. All of us want life. We want vitality. Jesus says, I'm the bread. And I get stuck at bread because I love food. But he says, bread of life. John chapter 6. John chapter, John chapter 11. I'm the resurrection and the life. John chapter 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's all in him. Through his spirit. That dwells in silence. Let me show you one more image. This was the best one I could get on Unsplash of a post apocalyptic wasteland. It's kind of dusty, I am. It was taken in Iran. I don't know by who. Your life might feel like this at the moment. Not a lot of fruitfulness. Not a lot of joy, not a lot of vitality, a lot of wild and a lot of waste. There's good news for you, and that is that the Holy Spirit can transform that 
new life. And not any life, life in abundance, life to the full, life that will last forever. Because that's what He does. He's always done it, and He can do it now. And I want you to just sit with us. I think most of us experience the impulse immediately to go, luckily it's not that bad. But just look at it. This isn't God's dream or intention for any single human being on earth. No human being living in a space like this makes God happy or pleases him because that's not what he created us for. So why on earth would we stay there? And I have to be honest, as your pastor, I cannot care how you got there. Just come out. Don't stay there. <laughs> because there's no condemnation or judgment for what got you there. But you'll be really foolish if you don't get out of here by this invitation. Because this is the kind of thing that God transforms. And He makes it beautiful. And He makes it new. And He works. And He hovers over it. And He overshadows it. And He brings forth life. I don't know where you are this morning. But I really do feel that this morning is a morning of reckoning. For most of us. Make a decision. And do it now. Are you in or are you not? I can't state it more plainly. And I can't give the invitation in more compelling, faithful to Scripture. You might have known the Holy Spirit at that point in your life, but you don't know Him anymore. But let Him fall afresh on you. And let Him create order, beauty, out of wild waste. He's so keen to do that. And He's right here in this place ready to help. Maybe you've never said, God, take my life. I submit all my wild and waste to you and I want you to create order and chaos out of it. That's how I got saved. That was literally my words. I'm going to say it in Afrikaans first. Here, I get a massive gemors van my Heere gemaakt en ek het nie wat my doen nie. Fuck it. That's how I got my life to go. I made a huge mess of my life and I don't know what to do anymore. So just take all of it. It's the best decision ever. Because he transformed this into what I am now, and he's still busy working inside. Holy Spirit, we praise you for the fact that you've chosen to dwell in us, and that your life, and that your love, and that your kingdom, and that your everlasting life is with us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you keep on giving us life. I trust you that you heard every prayer in this place this morning. I trust that you know where we have wild and waste in our lives. And I trust you to be one to bring order and beauty out of the chaos. We submit all of these things to you, Holy Spirit. And we praise you that you are working inside of us. Amen.